Vitalik just released a brand new blog post titled The Different Types of Layer 2s. In this video, I'll summarize all of the key points that he makes throughout this post and add some of my own thoughts as well. As always, subscribe to the channel for more Web3 videos, but let's dive right into it. The first point that he makes is essentially a lot of companies are actually working on creating Layer 2 chains right now. You know, originally in the L2 space, you would think of chains like Arbitrum and Optimism, but over the past one or two years, we have Polygon building multiple L2 chains, we have Tyco, we have Scroll, we have ZK Sync, and a bunch of other chains that are not necessarily directly going towards the EVM, but are Layer 2s in this broad kind of category nonetheless. And not only are companies building Layer 2s specifically, existing chains that were kind of previously alternative L1 chains, Layer 1 chains to compete with Ethereum, some of these chains such as Celo are actually migrating to become Layer 2s on top of Ethereum rather than compete at that L1 level. The point that he makes here is that all of these layer twos kind of come in different shapes and sizes and therefore have varying pros and cons for each chain. And I actually talk about this in this video on my channel where we review all of the different kinds of ZK EVMs, but this is more broadly talking about all different kinds of layer two chains. And with these differences between chains comes differences in prices and differences in security. So this brings us to our next point, which is where do each of these solutions and varying different kinds of L2 chains fit on this kind of scale between optimized for security and decentralization versus being optimized for scalability and maintaining a low cost for gas fees and keeping that as low as possible. The general rule of thumb is the more secure you want your chain to be, the more costly it is to actually achieve that level of security. Here is the table taken straight from Vitalik's blog post comparing rollups, validiums, and this disconnected or side chains or alternative chains or servers, compares them from a technological standpoint, a security standpoint, and a cost standpoint. Now I've kind of translated this into this diagram. This is kind of my mental model of the different kinds of scalability solutions. Down here, we have kind of alternative L1s or side chains that are kind of a separate ecosystem to Ethereum. Sometimes like in Polygon Proof of Stake's current state, it does sometimes post things like commitments back to Ethereum to inherit some security properties. But a lot of the time, alternative L1 chains don't inherit the security and the decentralization of Ethereum, right? They're kind of relying to say, hey, you need to trust our consensus mechanism. You need to trust our pool of validators that are maintaining the decentralization and security of the chain. So in general, they're kind of considered less secure than these layer two solutions, which do build on top of Ethereum and therefore inherit more of the decentralization and security properties of Ethereum than an alternative layer one is capable of doing. The two types of layer twos that he kind of broadly categorizes here are the rollups and the validiums. There's a pretty simple distinction that you can make between those two, which is rollups post proofs, which could be in the form of ZK proofs if you're building a ZK rollup or a fraud proof fraud proof or a fault proof in the case of an optimistic rollup. The only difference between a rollup and a validium here is rollups post the proof alongside all of the transaction data as well. So it actually takes all the transactions that it executes, batches them together and sends all of that information back to Ethereum. Whereas validiums say, well, hey, it's pretty expensive to send all of that transaction data across. What if we optimize this more for cost savings and just posted the proofs and not the transaction data down to Ethereum. So the rollups are more secure comparative to Validiums. Validiums are more scalable and cost optimized compared to rollups. The point that Vitalik makes here is you can kind of be in the middle ground between these three or, or somewhere else as well. Like you can kind of not strictly be a rollup and not strictly be a validium or not strictly be an alt L1, you can kind of also fit in the middle between all of these as well. So given that scale of security and uh, scalability, essentially, he then places some examples of where real world applications would want to fit into this scale. So on the kind of high security end, he says things like account key stores, high value financial assets, whereas on the kind of right side here, where it's fully optimized for scalability and low costs for things like games and social media applications or just broadly non-financial enterprise applications, he said here, belong in things like Validium. So essentially he's saying, hey, if you want more security, use the 
roll up, which is optimized for more security, right? If you want higher scalability and your users expect to either not pay gas fees at all or pay substantially lower gas fees, then you should be building on top of a Validium. I found this pretty interesting because this is pretty much exactly what Polygon is providing is both a ZK EVM roll up, which is a Polygon ZK EVM, and then Polygon proof of stake chain is upgrading or at least has a proposal to upgrade to a ZK EVM Validium. So it will provide both of these options for, hey, do you want a more optimized secure chain or do you want more optimized for scalability? And it actually talks about pretty much the exact same thing that Vitalik has said here where, hey, if you want high value DeFi applications, use the ZK EVM rollup. If you're building a Web3 game or a social application or micro DeFi that require high transaction volume and require low transaction fees, then you should use the upgraded Polygon ZK POS. The final section that Vitalik goes through in this particular blog post is the chain's ability to trustlessly read data from Ethereum. So what this means is the different kinds of L2s actually differ in what information they read from Ethereum and how often they do it, as well as how they kind of handle and react to when some edge cases happen, for example, a 51% attack or a hard fork in Ethereum, how do they actually react and change based on what's happening on Ethereum on the L2. Now this section does go pretty in depth into the details of bridges and things like that, but my key takeaway, at least from my interpretation, was this kind of section in this chart here. So we have down the bottom, it's it's a pretty confusing chart, I'm not going to lie, but it says essentially the more often you read Ethereum blocks. So for example, you can see there's a scale from no ability to read Ethereum all the way to can read all different kinds of Ethereum blocks, such as the finalized blocks or any blocks down here. The more often you're reading and essentially the less finalized, I guess, that block is that you're reading and relying on for a source of information on what the state of Ethereum is in your L2, the stronger the social commitment you need to handle the edge cases that might occur, such as a 51% attack or a hard fork, and how do you actually react to these changes in your L2 environment if these things were to occur? It's kind of funny. It's almost self-explanatory, but also really confusing at the same time. It's essentially saying, at least my interpretation is, well, if I'm relying on Ethereum strongly as a source of truth for what's happening on my L2 chain, then if something goes seriously wrong on Ethereum, such as a 51% attack or a hard fork, for example, then, well, the stronger my reliance on Ethereum, then the more impact it's going to have on my chain and therefore the stronger of a way of recovering my state of the chain via a social commitment is required. An example of this kind of social commitment is in his words, a form of governance gadget on Ethereum, for example, that could make the bridge contract aware of hard fork upgrades of the L2 chain. So my understanding of this article is essentially, yes, there's different shapes and sizes of L2s. And because of that, there are differences in the pros and cons that each of these L2s experience, which is going to naturally make them more suited to specific use cases and less suited to other use cases where it's up to really the application developer or the game developer to come in and say, this is the strength of what I want from a blockchain platform that I want to build on top of. Here's who can provide it to you. That's ultimately where I'm likely going to go ahead and actually build my application. So hopefully you enjoyed that quick little summary of the blog post. I'll leave the full link in the description if you want to check it out yourself. As always, thank you very much for watching. Remember to subscribe if you want to see more videos. Like the video, it helps me out in the algorithm. See you in the next one.